Hi. So I actually have no slides um, because uh, I uh, removed one word from each slide and then I ended up with none. And then uh, also it's probably a good thing given that uh, all the secret stuff that we are going to tell you here, it's probably good if nobody has that in print or in, in, in photo, right? So um, I have this huge grab bag of topics that I want to cover. Uh, basically, the stuff that we did in the last year and the stuff that we want to do in this year. Um, of course, like if you want me to talk about something specific, then, then just um, say so and I'll cover that. Other than that, I'll just go through my list and, and talk a little bit about each of these topics. It's not in any particular order. Um, it's just like when I sat down yesterday, it's the order that I came up with that stuff. It's actually quite a bit given that it's, I mean, it's, it's one year and we did a lot of things in the last one. And uh, yeah, it's looking good for the next one too. Anyway, so the, the, the first topic is uh, probably, you might have heard about that by now, is this KD bus. Um, I think we're really much done with that right now. Like the user space components, it's in system D, we have all the compatibility stuff in place. Um, it's kind of waiting on getting it into the kernel. I think that looks pretty good. Um, uh, so yeah, I figure, like I think most of the discussions in LKML are about documentation nowadays. And other than that, um, I kind of hope that it will enter soon actually in the distributions in the kernel. Um, so I guess, yeah, the moment when we, when we have that finally in there, we'll uh, open up the, the API that we have been using internally in systemd that acts as FDBus, uh, KDBus, like our API is called FDDBus. Um, so that uh, it's actually a new API for, for, for DBus that is supposed to be useful for lower level bits. It's actually a wonderful to work with for, for those who ever worked with the, the normal libdbus library, the classic one, you probably realize that it's not very, uh, like it's not much fun to actually work with it. Our own library, I think we spend a lot of time figuring out how to best expose the concepts of DBus for C programmers. So um, I think we have a very convincing library there. Anyway, expect that in the next year that um, this will enter the distributions and hopefully be useful to people. I'm not going to talk in detail about why KDBus is awesome. We did quite a few talks about that. There has been lots of discussions. So look it up on the internet. You'll find videos on YouTube and everything if you want to know more. Um, yeah, and the next topic is NSpawn. I'm not sure if you guys know that it's still not necessarily the best known uh, pro part of systemd. NSpawn is, uh, you know, it started out as this test case for ourselves. Endspawn is a, is, a, is a little container manager, like a minimal container manager, um, because uh, well, we developed an init system, and to actually be able to test the init system without constantly having to reboot your physical machine, um, we thought, okay, let's all just test that in a container. And then we played around with the container managers that were there, like it was the time before Docker. It was uh, LXC basically thought, okay, we can write our own one that is like, because it's just a couple of system calls you have to execute in the kernel to create that. And then we thought, okay, we do that and it works a little bit more automatic um, so that we can test our stuff and can also make sure that systemd works perfectly in a container because like the container environment is slightly different from the real one because you don't have actual hardware to work with like slash this is a little bit weird because it's usually read only and as a Linux doesn't work and all these kind of things like there are all kinds of difference. So we thought, okay, that, so that is how initially Endspawn was created, just this minimal container manager. But it grew over time because we always had more stuff to test. Like we, we for example, um, Tom worked on NetworkD and so we thought, okay, we need to make sure that Endspawn can set up like this minimal networking stuff so that we can actually test NetworkD like the DHCP stuff, for example, that we have one container that would can be the DHCP server and the other one the DHCP client and we can actually test that. So anyway, Endspawn over the year, um, well, like, I mean, it's a little bit older actually than one year. It actually grew to some real useful tool, and I think in many ways it now uh, can do more even than, than LXC can, um, even though it's still kind of a short piece of code actually. Um, like, uh, one of the, like, uh, like uh, especially in the last month, I've, I've added a lot of um, little uh, tools to it. Like, for example, over Christmas it gained support so that we can actually dissect, um, like, uh, um, VM images um, from, like, like just like for example, QCOW2 images, and uh, it will it will just boot them. The idea there being that uh, Fedora and, and Ubuntu and these things um, they all provide uh, cloud images, which are basically just just ready-made images with a very basic um, uh, install. And I want just wanted to make sure that Endspawn can that you can just use Endspawn on top of these images without any kind of magic setup. 
and then we'll do a loopback device. Um, we'll um, attach the files, we'll pass a partition table, we'll find the root file system, we'll boot it. So that in many ways it feels like you would run QEMO, except that you don't. You just run a simple container that just works. Um, and that, that is actually really, really amazing because we, you, we also added a little bit of a, uh, like a, a small tool that can download those images. So you actually just pass it an, an HTTP URL and we'll download those images. Like it actually has support for three um, image formats, like for the raw one, for which can also be QCOW2, um, for tarballs, and for actually something that's compatible with the other like Docker thing that it can download that and run it. Um, and it will actually do, do um, cryptographic verification and, and check some of these kind of things so that it's actually something that people could really de deploy. And so like with two lines you can now download something um, that just works. And with the amount of code it's actually kind of amazing because it's really, s like it's a little more, bit more than the few system calls now, but um, like nspawn itself, for example, is one source file and that's about it and it can do all that magic um, stuff uh, like, like doing loopbacks and things like that. So, um, yeah, we also added um, uh, lots of support around this. Like, we have this thing, Machine D, which you can use to register. Like, um, for example, Libvirt, LXC, and these the container managers call into Machine D just to tell um, the system about the fact that there's a container running. This is uh, like we, we we added support then for for system control and all the other commands that we have in System D, so that they can actually connect to these containers and are aware of this. This all takes inspiration, by the way, from the way how Solaris. Um, introduced the zones concept where the zones concept is basically viable in pretty much every single tool that Solaris exposes. Like their service management tool, like their counterpart to system control is zones aware and so we thought it actually makes a lot of sense to make system control is, um, container aware as well so that you can basically get a list not only of the services that are running on the local like immediate system but also recursively to send down into the local containers and show the services are running inside of that. Um, and also, like if you if you um, like just by specifying one parameter, you can um, start um, and stop a service not on the local node, but also in any of the containers that are running locally. So um, yeah, we also added quite a bit of support. Like you can now clone containers because it's actually also not very <laughs> complex to do that. You can copy files in and out of a container during while they're running. You can mount stuff into a container while it's running and things like that. It's actually really, really um, useful, um, comprehensive solution nowadays. And in many ways, I mean, LXC can a couple of things. It can do a couple of things that we can't, like has all this magic for LVM and things like that. But for the fact that how little it is, um, it's kind of amazing that we do a couple of things that LXC and the others do not. Anyway, um, that's uh, so much about the container stuff. I, I, I like that stuff a lot, actually. And we'll probably add a. Uh, a bit more to that. Um, for us, the vision is really like um, making what Solaris had with zones, um, bringing that to Linux and to this level of integration. So, I mean, it goes everywhere. Like, like for example, the journal. Like, if you use journal control, that you can actually show the, the the logs from any container that you have, and not only the system. So that 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 the the way how we consider servers um, in the end is 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 actually that a server is always a collection of this main node itself plus all its containers and that all the tools that we run on them are aware that there's probably some containers running and that you can recursively descend into that. Um, what else? Um, we also recently added uh, quite a bit of hookup uh, with ButterFS. Um, this is like, um, we do believe in ButterFS as being the next um, uh, like file system for, for Linux, even though some parts of, especially Red Hat, don't agree with that. But um, it's like, uh, like this starts from, from very superficial things. Like, you know, th this temp files component that we have, it creates um, volatile and, and, and temporary files and directories and then slash run and these things. And now has support, for example, to create a, a ButterFS subvolume. But it's not only that, like for journal D, we added a lot of support so that we can automatically defrag the journal files because we actually, like the, the way how the journal um, writes to the files, like the, the, the write pattern was not particularly um, compatible with the way how a copy and write file systems uh, um, expect things to be written to be efficient. Um, so we added some magic support for that and, and these kind of things. So it's kind of like, an, and for example, machine D, like this <coughs> component that I talked to about with the container stuff has support for for actually, like it, it recognizes if, if, if your container image is actually just a butterfly sub volume and then you can do quota and these kind of things. You can do snapshots and stuff. So it's, it's kind of um, nicely integrated now. Um, so yeah, this, this is probably like we'll like the next version that we'll release. It's hopefully coming in two weeks or something. 
um, will be big on, on butter as integration. So the next topic, something that we are working on right now, like Daniel, who I don't actually know where he is, I added this, um, which is uh, uh, some, some very minimal firewall support. Like the, the, the reason for that being is like we believe like if you want to have a local firewall, um, then you probably should not match on ports and, and, and like how you classically did this because ports are not a good identifier for what your actual service is that lo is locally running. So I, I believe it's much more interesting being able to say allow a a Apache the access to the internet um, rather than saying allow port 80 the access to the internet. Um, simply for the reason that nowadays um, services tend to have way more ports and uh, dynamically assigned ports. Like if you have a um, I don't know, a BitTorrent client or something, uses completely random ports and you cannot actually express it in the firewall. So we thought, um, okay, let's, let's uh, somehow find a way how we can connect the firewall to, the, to, to service management so that you can actually inside of your firewall express, please allow Apache or bit, uh, please allow my BitTorrent server or please allow whatever other server I'm running access to the internet but nothing else. This consists of a couple of things, like uh, it makes use of, of a cgroup controller called NetClass um, and uh, basically it allows assigning an ID that you can either manually assign to each service or that is automatically assigned of each server. This, that's a numeric ID and then inside of the firewall you can, you can reference that ID. So the idea there is that these IDs are automatically designed now, uh, assigned now in, in, in systemd and that we provide a very, very minimal um, Boolean switch um, as well um, that you can put inside of a unit file that says basically internet access yes or no. And yeah, and it, it will basically reflect down into, into uh, uh, the, the, the firewall settings um, effectively. So I think in many cases, um, like like a good chunk of, of the firewall uses cases, we can much nicer cover with that than you could by actually writing down rules that list all the ports and then you would have to stick to fixed ports and these kind of things. And then actually the nice thing is it actually works for incoming and outgoing traffic the same way, which is something that, that didn't used to be available. Um, so expect that um, pretty soon to show up. Um, because it's mostly actually done. Um, something else that uh, David has been working on, who I don't see either here right now, um, is uh, console support. Like uh, um, he wrote support that, that uh, we can run the, the, the text co console basically in user space and have it access DRM and these kind of things. Um, as you know, like on Linux, this was traditionally done by a kernel component. But uh, nobody is maintaining that and hasn't been maintaining that in, in 10 years. And the kernel people really, really want to get rid of all the font management and these kind of things. Um, this is like, this shows its ace particularly because like, for example, nowadays, m most of the laptops come out with high DPI screens, but the Linux kernel console cannot deal with that. Um, because like, yeah, you will get these tiny fonts in the, in the top left corner and you cannot use your machine if you actually use a, a kernel console like it is right now. So um, what David has been working on is actually getting um, a user space um, thing that basically it's just a f renderer for, for, for bitmap fonts on, on DRM. Um, so th this gives us a lot of things like, like for example, it's completely scalable. You can have like make sure that even if you have a ridiculously high, uh, large screen with super high DPI that you still get 80, 25 if you want that. Um, and uh, um, it has uh, support for Unicode. Like uh, there's another issue like in the, in the classic uh, the kernel console you had like you could bring 512 different characters to screen at any time, but not more, which is not sufficient for any kind of Unicode support. So, so the console D stuff actually adds proper Unicode support there um, so that you can basically show everything that Unicode has. Well, with limits, I mean, it's still a text mode interface, right? Um, so uh, we kind of hope to push that into the distributions um, soon as well. Um, and uh, hopefully it will get give better experience for everybody who's not just stuck to English and everybody who has high DPI screens and still wants to use the console. It also, by the way, has, uh, has pretty nice effects because it actually is a uh, multi-seat aware. So um, um, I kind of like this, this um, concept that you have these USB um, uh, port multipliers that are basically like this, this piece of hardware, this multi-seat hardware that, that basically is just some USB device that has a, has a mouse, a keyboard, um, and VGA, and then you can plug that into your server and you get a second screen with a proper console that you can just lock into. So in your, in your server room, you can actually, with your little um, a trolley there, um, uh, have the screen, the keyboard on it with that little adapter, and then you just by plugging in USB, you get your different seat that actually shows a proper console instead of anything else. Anyway, um, all these things, are, it's going to be much nicer than everything that we had before. 
Then something that the administrator is going to like, it's more like a small feature or two small features is um, uh, we, we, like in the last year, added support for some command called system control edit um, and one command called system control cat. Um, system control cat, like C-A-T, like that famous Unix command, will just show you the, the unit file, like the content of the unit file that you specify. Um, and it will actually resolve like these drop-ins and, and basically follow how, how the overriding scheme and the extension scheme of uh, for system unit files works. So it's a really useful, very simple command that could basically tells you, so if, I, if Apache has started what's actually the resulting unit file with all the drop-ins, everything resolved. And then system control edit is basically something that, that uh, um, basically gives you the, the unit file to edit and you, the, it starts Vim, basically, you can make it change. You, you just press save and it will be automatically added to Etsy and be reloaded and these kind of things. I'm pretty sure that this is a really useful tool for most administrators um, because they can actually, yeah, not, don't have to deal to actually descend into the directories and use a lib and Etsy and figure out what they actually want to overwrite there. So that's a small one. Another small one that I think is pretty useful for administrators is we added this, you know, for a while actually we, we had this module in there, NSS my host name, which you might or might not be aware of. It's like, or like the NSS is the, the this part of, of Glipsy that does name resolution, like host name resolution. Um, and we have this module that, that we added a long time ago already that resolves the local host name, whatever that is, to the local IP addresses for whatever they are. Um, this is like traditionally um, the, the installers, um, the operating system installers patched Etsy hosts for that. But because we wanted to move to stateless systems where basically Etsy can be empty and everything still works, we added this module back then which resolved um, simply the whatever the local host name is to the local IP addresses. Um, as a fallback if DNS doesn't provide that information. Um, and we recently added um, two more features to that. Like first of all, local host itself is resolved so that you actually can go without any Etsy host. So it will resolve the host name, localhost to 127001. And the other new one, which I actually wanted to mention here, is the is uh, there's basically, if, the, if you, you can now write ping gateway, and gateway, that host name is automatically resolved to all the IP addresses of all your default gateways for whatever they be, uh, are ordered by the routing metric, if you follow what I mean. It basically means that in 90% in of the cases, if you have your laptop and you try to figure out, am I connected to, to some working network, then you can just type ping gateway and it will automatically resolve to whatever your default gateway currently is. I'm pretty sure this is actually really, really useful for, like, I mean, I, it's at least useful for me, um, not only for administrators, but uh, simply because it saves you looking up what your routing table is and figuring out if you can actually um, ping that thing. So, Next topic is Network D. I'm probably not going to talk too much about that because Tom already did a great talk about that yesterday. But um, in January last year, we added Network D, like which is a network component. We believe that network management is like one of the most basic sy things that the operating system should do, and hence we believe that it um, should be in systemd. Um, it's like for the fact that it's only one year old, it's actually really really awesome now because it has like um, internal implementations of DHCP. Like our policy, like our our philosophy with developing is always that we don't want to do like gluing things together with shell scripts and things like that. So uh, for the DHCP case, um, we looked at all the solutions and figured out, well, there is no library that does proper DHCP and things like that um, that we can use. So we wrote our own, which is part of Systemd now, which is actually so good that the network manager people e e <laughs> now are linking to that library uh, as well. Um, so we, we basically have native DHCP4, DHCP6, even DHCP4 server support. Um, if you take this all together, like like the, the container stuff that I talked about earlier and the network D stuff, we actually have this nice functionality now that that um, uh, if an end spawn container starts, it can create a VTH um, um, tunnel basically, so that the VTH tunnel is basically a virtual Ethernet thing that where, where one side um, um, is inside the container and the other side is on the host. And now if you run network D inside of the container, which is like network D is, is uh, like pretty much the only network management demo that can run nicely in a container because it doesn't, like it knows what to do inside of a container because in, inside of a container you don't have UDEF, you don't have proper hardware enumeration, no, no proper hardware events, but it can still deal, like it recognizes that it can deal properly with that and do the right thing. So if you run network D inside of the container, it will just get DHCP and DH, um, like what you would expect. And outside of the container, um, network D will actually do DHCP4 like explicit, explicitly for each of these VTH links that shows up and will automatically um, pick a, an IP range for each of these interfaces 
So that basically, and also it nowadays um, has support for, for it, it talks to, to, to IP, like the net filter in the kernel, like uh, without actually shelling out to IP tables or anything, like it talks directly to the kernel so that we can set up mask rating for, for IPv4 automatically. Um, the net result being that if you s um, uh, start your container in end spawn, you without any kind of configuration got automatically access to the internet and this is all done by DHCP. Actually, you could, could do the exact same thing even if you had KVM running there. And it does not involve um, like DNS mask and these things um, like what, what people traditionally use in for, the, for the container solutions. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, everything is routed via via IP on, on the kernel level without any kind of proxy, any kind of anything um, uh, sitting there that, that actually looks into the packets that forwards them, right? Like it's, it's the kernel itself that routes everything. Um, and uh, even without a bridge, it's like basically every single VETH link is managed individually. So um, for us, I mean, DHCP, people, of course, like when they heard that for the first time said, oh my God, now they're taking a DHCP server inconsistently. For us, you know, a DHCP, one should not, um, um, overestimate the, the, the complexity of DHCP server side. Actually, the DHCP server is simpler than the DHCP client side um, because it, I mean, it knows everything. It just has to say respond to requests while, while on, on client side you have to, to, to issue the request and then repeat the request and, and deal with, with, with lost packets and these kind of things. So for us, it was a very natural thing adding that because it's kind of this, this the other side of the metal. Like if you do DHCP server, DHCP client, it should just be, like it's just this really, really basic thing. Um, that just works, it uh, should just work. Anyway, so much about Network D. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I talked to Patrick Flick about that and um, he thought he could get away with not doing that, but um, he has to do that, like, because we need the NTP and, and things like that, because, I mean, there's, there's the, 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 the ICMP6, the route advertisement stuff that does some bit, but you cannot learn more than than actual DNS about that, so we, we will need that too. Um, but I, I think he, he, he even started working on that, he mentioned, but you might know more actually than I do. Um, uh, next thing uh, is auditing. You know, auditing is this thing that, that the NSA requires if you want to sell something to the NSA. Um, it, is, it is a mess. It's absolutely a disaster if you ask me. It's, it's, it has so many security holes, like it probably makes your system more insecure when you run it. But uh, auditing in, 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 in theory actually has nice functionality. Like it has this nice functionality that you can say, um, get me a log message each time any process on the system opens at the pass WD or any, any other file of the, on the operating system. You can install these matches and then, then you get these log things. Um, now traditionally it was completely separate from any kind of other logging and um, we recently added to, to journal support so, the, so that we can get these audit messages is directly from the kernel, can, can uh, uh, parse them apart, can index them, um, so that it can actually um, take benefit of these messages as well. Um, it's kind of, it's, it's really, really useful actually. It's, it's, it, we have a nicer audit client now um, simply because the journal tools index everything and you can browse for, for specific fields than the audit tools themselves actually have um, because they don't index. They just grab through text files with, with basically SD or SDR, like the C function, which basically means they have no understanding of any of the fields and things like that. Um, so it's kind of, it's kind of, it's really, really nice. It's like if you want to use audit, it's, it's much nicer using that through the journal now than, than, than actually using the audit tools themselves. Then something we worked on is uh, we want to um, make sure that Linux distributions can uh, go into the direction that we can have stateless systems, where stateless systems basically mean that you only have a slash user directory and nothing else, and it boots up properly. So that the, the actual operating system, like the, the vendor data, like the binaries, the libraries, are all contained in slash user, and if the system boots up for the first time and finds that Etsy and slash var are unpopulated, like th there's nothing in there, then we will do the necessary things to populate the minimal bits to be able to boot up. The, the essence, like the effect of that is that as an administrator, you can then always know that the files that are in Etsy are the changes that you made um, and are not the, the, the default configuration from the vendor. So it basically means, yeah, if you want to know what did I actually configure on that system, you can just go to Etsy and see whatever is in there. That's what you did um, and not what the, what, the, what the vendor did. So um, these kind of, like, this stateless stuff is actually pretty awesome because you can actually also define systems that where every single boot is, is, is initialized like that and then they are fully stateless, basically. 
um, so that they, they, they just start up, get the stuff set up in Etsy, and the moment you, you terminate them, all the stuff is flushed out again. Um, yeah, and the, the, this, of course, like it, it creates a little bit of complexity what you do with updates. Like if you upgrade your slash user, then what do you do? Uh, like and, and it installs a new version of the software, then sometimes you need to update the stuff in Etsy as well um, because the configuration file changes and things like that. So we added a lot of infrastructure for that too so that packages can hook that in nicely. Um, some of the specific complexities of this, of course, is Etsy pass WD um, because you need the parcel database initialized because if you don't have that, you cannot boot up because you don't have any use of that root. Um, and uh, there, there's some complexity involved in that because um, we always have to dynamically assign the user IDs on Linux because the Linux user ID space is so small. Right? You basically have a thousand user IDs um, for, for the system stuff, so we cannot predefine that from the, from the vendor side. It must be um, assigned individually on the system because, uh, yeah, every system will have different packages installed and, and like distributions like Fedora and Debian have way more than a thousand packets, uh, packages, so you could not assign one user ID to each package um, if they wanted that because there's simply not that much room um, uh, available if you follow at all what I'm dabbling here about this stuff. So we added this concept that's called sysusers, um, which basically allows um, dynamically, like yeah, you boot up and all the users are dynamically created, um, like the system users that you, you need. Next topic um, is resolve D. Um, like uh, for, for a while we looked at the, uh, the DNS situation because uh, um, we need something um, we saw that, that can actually properly handle all the complexities that we want with DNS these days. Like for example, for me personally on my laptop, for example, I'm, I'm pretty often logged into the Red Hat VPN and then I also have my local network and while I'm in the Red Hat VPN, I would traditionally use the Red Hat DNS service and then I could not resolve any of the names of my local network. And if I'm connected to the local network, I couldn't really um, uh, resolve any of the Red Hat internal um, uh, DNS names. So um, we looked at that for a while and figured out, okay, DNS is so basic, we should cover that and it should be smart. Uh, smart in the regard that, that there should be um, a cache maintained per interface and so that, that if we have no idea where to send a DNS request, like because it's not, doesn't have a, like it's not explicitly scoped, we can actually send it to every single interface, like the DNS service for every single interface at the same time to, to create the impression that all the, 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 the name resolving is merged and you have the single view on, on, on the uh, host name resolution. So um, this is implemented, it's kind of nice because, because all the problem of, of cache flushing and these things go, goes completely away because ResolveD actually tracks which interfaces come and go and as every cache um, is maintained per interface, when an interface goes, the cache goes away. So you never have this problem that you log out of, of something and the and or you log into something and the, the negative cache entry will, will still be in there and tell you that that's not resolvable. Um, then we added support for LLM and R. LLM and R is like this um, uh, Microsoft link local multicast name resolution thing. It's basically what all the Windows versions do for, for local um, name resolution. It's kind of a little bit what, what Avahi does, if you know that. Avahi though uses the Apple protocol. Um, the reason I wanted that is, is actually for container stuff because um, I want the ability that, that if you run containers with, with this stuff that, that we talked about earlier here with um, uh, nSpawn, for example, and VETH links and, and NetworkD doing DHCP, then you also actually want name resolution. So, and for the name resolution, we, we did a couple of things, and one of them is LLM and R, because it basically allows you on local links to do name resolution without having a real DNS um, uh, running. So we implemented that. It's kind of nice even because now even if you run a VM like a Windows VM, you can also resolve the local host names, like the, all the host names of all the VMs that you run completely automatically because Windows does LLM and R and we do. Um, we are going to add a couple of more things. Like actually Resolve Deep does quite a few things um, now, but uh, the next things that, that are on the list are um, DNSX support that, that isn't glued on top, but it's just part of it. And um, actually the, the I want to also implement the protocols from from uh, like the Avahi protocols and kind of get rid of Avahi um, that way so that we do the Apple style zero conf as well. So that it's kind of the, the unified solution for doing any kind of name resolution and it will be completely hidden which protocol is used if it's the classic DNS, classic DNS with DNSSEC, um, if it's LMNR or if it's MDNS and will all work the same and, and, and give you a unified view and you can even, it will even f deal with all the issues because uh, uh, um, Apple um, zero conf used the .local domain 
um, for, 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 for doing the multicasting stuff. Um, Microsoft, when you install Active Directory, suggested that you use the .local domain for, for, for your Active Directory setup for the unicast DNS stuff. So this was already always messy because um, if you used Avahi against some <coughs> corporate network running Microsoft Active Directory where somebody just clicked OK, OK, OK on the wizard, then you would have trouble resolving one or the other. So, but these problems will then go away because we can transparently merge six. Of course, I mean, the problems don't go, go entirely away because you still have the problem that if there's a name that's about both zones, then what do you do with it? So, um, anyway, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, we, we will try to push that into the distributions um, um, as soon as we have DNSSEC support because then it's actually, you know, it's, it's not this glued on top. Like, uh, I know that Fedora, for example, they, they, they now want to run a local DNS server to get the DNSSEC stuff. We don't really think that that's the right approach, that, that clients should never, and, and in containers and, and even servers, um, unless they are actual DNS servers, should probably not run a DNS service, our belief. It should just be a core component of the client and should not be something you add on top, not something that listens on an IP port, some just something that can issue stuff and wait for the response, but nothing else. Um, next thing, journal de-remoting. This is something Zbigniew, like one of our guys, um, worked on. Um, uh, journal de-remoting is basically, you know, the journal D, like this, this, this thing, the binary log is this thing that everybody hates so much, that it's binary log. Is, but um, uh, we now have remoting. Remoting, in this case, is basically, it's just HTTP. Um, because we saw, like, the, you know, traditionally logging was done with BSD syslog protocol, and um, th th that has quite a few shortcomings. Like, for starters, it's not standardized, right? Like, they put together an RFC that kind of summarizes how most people implement it, but, um, I mean, yeah, and then, then, then it doesn't have time zones. Like, for example, like, like, you're expected to log in the local time zone, but if you have more than two machines, then what the f is supposed to be the local time zone? You, you cannot even figure out what the time zone was, what it in included and it only can do a one line log, it's kind of doing binary stuff and it's, it's lossy, right? The classic BSD stuff. So um, we thought, okay, we live in the uh, 21st century now, so maybe we should actually use HTTP for logging instead of inventing our own stuff. So with, with JournalD we now have um, something basically where you, where you have a pull model and a push model and the pull model is basically HTTP GET, like well, you can connect to some machine and pull out the logs with HTTP GET and you get a JSON stream and that's how it works. Um, and if you, we also have a push model um, where, where the machine logs to, to something else and it's just the HTTP push, uh, post. Um, and so we kind of have said, okay, yeah, we don't like the BSD syslog protocol, we don't want to come up with our own stuff, everything needs to be HTTP these days, so let's just do that and do things that way. And it basically means that people can write their own little tiny HTTP PHP programs even to get the logs out of um, or get logged into and things like that. And people can do amazing stuff with that. And uh, it, it's actually kind of nice because um, we have this concept of curses that basically allows programs to remember where they left off and then continue uh, the next time they will get all the log data just be, uh, um, starting with that point in time. And um, yeah, it's, it, it's kind of cool actually, the, the, this kind of, uh, Logging. Then uh, that's generally remoting. And the next thing is Cordam support. Um, like uh, since since a long time, system was actually be able, uh, able to collect the Cordams and stick them in the journal. Um, we beefed that up now, and now it finally is actually useful. Um, in in that regard, like um, it will now actually it uses like lib ELF utils and will actually process the Cordams and, and generate stack traces out of them and stick that in the journal as pretty much normal log data. So basically, um, if you just install systemd now. Um, and something Cordams, the effect is that you actually get the stack trace just like, like that without, n without having a GDB or anything installed. Um, it just ends up there, which is wonderful for embedded devices because, yeah, if something goes wrong, you really want the stack trace, but you do not want to install your development kit on the, on the embedded device to actually get the stack trace out of it. Um, uh, yeah, well, I mean, no. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but uh, I, I mean, it, it's always a matter of question, like what we drop. There has been a request that we add some concept to journal D, and I'm open to that, but we haven't implemented that yet, which would um, take the, the priority into account for, for um, what is dropped first, basically. So that when rotation comes, we drop the debug stuff first and, and, and the, the unimportant stuff and leave the really important stuff later before we, we drop that stuff. Also, by the way, the, the new Cordam stuff actually will not, uh, like, by default, it actually stores the Cordams in some directory. 
um, instead of uh, pushing it always into the journal, uh, which basically means that, that the big data is actually in this, in it's, 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 it's uh, a different age, like it's age like slash temp is age, like so that it goes through there and if it wasn't, um, like make sure that it never grows beyond some size and <laughs> we remove the oldest one there and you can actually, like the reason why we put it there is because GDB then can access it directly, like if you wanna start GDB. Actually the, the tools around the core dumping are really, really nice too. Like there's core dump control, and uh, now and you can just, it's like if you're a developer, it's like the best thing ever because now if something crashes on your system, you get this log message and you see, oh my God, okay, so let's see what that is. And you just type in core dump control GDB and that's it and we'll figure out the last core dump and we'll actually start GDB on and you can immediately go on and figure out what actually was wrong. It's, it's so useful. Um, it's, and it's so much nicer what we ever had in that area. Um, so next thing is uh, protect term protect system. So we had all this name, like, namespacing stuff, we were playing around with Endspawn and then we thought, okay, we add that to service management as well. Um, so we have these, these high level options now for services. Uh, one is protect system, one is protect home, one is private devices, one is private uh, temp, which basically set up minimal namespaced environments for individual services. Like there's protect um, system, uh, which basically says run this service like you would normally do, however, mark um, slash user entirely read only. Right, and then it actually has three settings, like off, this thing that I just said with slash user read only in one where also slash Etsy is read only. Um, so it's like a mini sandbox that, that is very, very simple to use. It's, it's effectively just this try state. If you set that, you, you gain security because like most daemons shall not be able to write slash user. Like it's, it's pretty much only software update daemons that are supposed to ever write to slash user. Um, then we have something similar, it's called private home. Um, you figure probably guess it that it will just make slash home read only. It actually is also tree state. You you can turn it off, which it is by default, by the way. <laughs> you can make slash home read only, and you can make slash home unavailable, where it basically will appear as an empty directory to the daemon. This is also wonderful because almost no daemon actually needs access to slash home, with the exception of Samba and maybe in some cases Apache. But um, it's it's really really easy to do. And like in Fedora, we have do adopted it in quite a few services now. Um, because it's like, you, you, like it, it's understand, like, you know, we have these security technologies like SO Linux, but frankly, nobody understands it except for Dan Walsh. And this is kind of supposed to be the thing that everybody gets because it's just really tri-state that I can explain that to you in like two minutes. And I already repeated myself. So it actually, if I really try, I can explain it in 10 seconds to everybody. So I think it's a, it's a really useful um, functionality because that's so easy and adds security. And then there are two more settings. It's private temp. Uh, which gives um, like a private slash temp basically to a service because uh, there's this huge amount of serv like like code that is exploitable simply because uh, it does unsecure slash temp uh, uh, handling because it uses guessable to file names and things like that and uh, some other unprivileged code might run on the same system which also uh, which guesses then the, the, the uh, um, file names and then can play games with your daemon. Um, with private TMP, all the problem goes away because that daemon will have its specific subdirectory in slash temp where, where it can do whatever it wants, but nobody can look inside and it cannot look at outside of it. Um, this is kind of nice because like ideally, we of course would, uh, would turn this on system-wide so that every single service, every single user gets his own instance of slash temp and these entirely, uh, this entire security problem goes away. I don't think we can do that because uh, like slash temp is used for communication by X11, for example. Um, so um, yeah. Um, but uh, individually for service we can do that. And the other one was private devices. Private devices is, is also Boolean. If you turn that on for a service, then you get a, a private slash dev directory. Um, and then set that private slash dev directory, there will be gone every device node for physical device access. So the only things that remain are basically dev null, dev zero, dev full, dev random, dev view random, like these virtual devices that are more API than actually physical devices. But um, for example, all the hard disk device nodes like dev SDA and things like that will be removed. This is a good thing because it, most services actually don't need physical device access. And especially for network facing daemons, it's kind of cool that you can turn that off and it goes away. And you know that they will, whatever they do, regardless what privileges they have, they will not be able to directly access your, your, your file system and do bullshit with it. Um, well, I mean, this stuff is really supposed to be easy, right? Like, it's, it's, it's the, the, the one-stop solution. But you can actually do this, like, with some other stuff we have. Like, there's a hookup for the device's C-group controller. 
like devices, that, that's what the name is, and you can configure that individually. So in, if you use that, then the slash dev directory will be fully populated and everything, but you can restrict very, very precisely what the service shall be able to access from it. So um, yeah, private devices are supposed to be super, super simple, just this boolean that everybody understands that I can explain to everybody in 10 seconds. But if you want to have this individual lockdown, then you can can use the device cgroup control. It's actually really easy too. You basically say say um, uh, uh, what do you actually device allow, and then you specify def sda for example, and say read and write or something. Or you can like th this is for individual devices. Or you can um, also say something for entire device classes. Like for example, if you want to allow access to the to the all hardest, you could say allow devices uh, block dash sd. Right. Um, it's, it's a really powerful thing. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, the private devices thing is completely, it's a one-time thing, right? When the service is started, um, slash dev is set up with only these, these things, and that's, that's the end of the story, right? But if you, you want to access real physical hardware, you need to deal with hot plug because yeah, devices can come and go and, and things like that. And that's why, you, if you want to do that, then you get the full populated slash dev, but you can still control um, what you want to limit things to. Anyway, next topic, um, a time sync D. So this is something we added uh, last year as well um, because uh, we figured that every single machine that we have now, regardless if it's a phone, if it's a, if it's a node on a cluster or something, needs correct time. And we also saw that uh, maybe we should not always run an NTP server off, off it, uh, on it, but just some tiny thing that can pull the time and, and, and keep it synchronized. Um, so we add, um, uh, added time sync D to it, which is a trivial NTP or SNTP client actually. It, it doesn't do the full NTP protocol with the handling multiple servers and, 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 and it also doesn't provide time to anything. All it does is the minimal stuff necessary that we think that 99% of the machines um, on the internet, the ones that actually need the time and don't serve it, will require. Um, uh, it's, it's really, really simple, really easy, really nice. Um, it just works. It has a nice integration network D because um, network D learns NTP servers via DHCP and will just pass them on to, to TimeSync D. It also has like magic support um, because we realized like especially in amateur devices, um, they don't necessarily have RTC. So if you don't have a battery buffered RTC, every time they boot up, they, they have no time. Um, but you actually like don't wanna, like it's really annoying if the, if the Every time you boot up the machine, like for the first five seconds or something, it doesn't have any time because then everything that writes to disk at that time has timestamps that are 1970. So um, with TimeSync D, we then added this, this a little bit of a magic that, that every time we get a time fix from the network, we actually sync, like we touch a file in slash var and during early boot, we read that file and look at the, at the timestamp of it. And the effect of that is that you might not boot up with correct time then, because I mean, if there is no way to get it, then there is no way to get it. But at least you get monotonic time, which just has this nice effect that that all the timestamps that hit on disk, if you compare them to the stuff from the previous reboot, uh, boot, then they will at least be monotonic. So um, yeah, if you use time sync D, it's, it's really awesome because it will just work. It will just get the data out of DHCP when it can. But if it can't, it does the best thing that you can do if you don't have time, which is make it uh, monotonic. And it's kind of simple. This doesn't mean like if you want to run, like um, if you actually care about the most accurate time possible, then you probably don't want to run time sync D, but something way more complex that does PTP and whatnot. But I'm pretty sure for 99% of the machines on the internet, time sync D is pr all that is um, required. Um, next thing, GPT auto discovery, which uh, I think is actually really nice. Um, is is uh, we before the stateless system stuff, we wanted to make sure that the system can actually boot out with SC, without SCFS tab. Now, traditionally in SCFS tab, you configure swaps. You configure um, uh, like like if you shall mount something on slash home. So we thought if we want to get rid of that, then maybe or not get rid of it, but make it optional, then um, maybe we should find a way to automatically discover the partitions instead. So what Systemd has now is that that when you boot up, it will automatically discover every every swap device. If you use GPT though, only um, and enable it, right? Like because GPT has this expressive way how you can tag partitions with a GPT type ID, like a UUID, um, that make very clear that this is a swap partition, and then we read that and uh, like we refine it, we enable it automatically, and we also have support for finding home directories and slash SRV that way, and uh, also root directories um, and root directories individually for each architecture. 
So putting this all together, you can basically boot up without SPFS step, but still get the swap file, um, uh, 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 like the swap partition enabled. You still get slash home mounted, you still slash get SRV mounted completely automatically without anything um, you have to configure. It's, 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 it's really nice, actually. Um, that's GPT auto discovery. And actually, the GPT auto discovery then, then plays a role again with NSPON again. Like, if you have an image that, that tags the partitions that nicely, um, Fedora, by the way, the Fedora installer currently doesn't. I opened a bug that they do, but so far they ignore that. But um, if you if you if you tag your partitions that way, then Anspawn can actually use a disk image and figure out auto everything automatically as well and set everything correctly, um, so that even if you run Anspawn, then everything's mounted the way you want it. Um, then something we we had a removal of something as well, um, like we dropped the read ahead implementation. You know, read ahead was a thing that if on rotating media, we re remember from a previous boot what pre precisely were the sectors that were needed at boot. And then, so that on a subsequent boot, we could load those linearly into memory on the assumption that it would be faster. And it was in some cases, but we had this problem like in the, in the times of SSD, it doesn't cut it anymore. We, you, while, I mean, there's a theoretic, a theoretic benefit still if you can um, give the kernel as many sectors as you want that you want re to read. The effect in real life is that it was not like it didn't have any benefit on SSDs, and and SSDs, and none of us developers still had rotating media. So because we have this problem that we need maintainers maintainers for all the code that we have in systemd, we tried to find maintainers for the read head stuff, and eventually because nobody volunteered, um, we decided that maybe it's time to let it go. So we removed that part. So the next systemd versions, or actually it's already the last one, does not include that anymore. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, in general, like, if you want a fast boot up, maybe using um, rotating rust is not the best idea anyway. But, uh, yeah, so, so we removed that bit. And then the last thing that I want to talk about, which is looking forward a bit, is uh, we probably, and people are going to hate that, but uh, we'll do it, do it anyway, um, <laughs> is uh, we'll, we'll um, merge uh, gummy boot into systemd. Um, the rationale for that, uh, we have a re really strong reason. Um, is that uh, like like we're working toward this model where we can can build something like uh, a Chromebooks where um, you have this functionality that the firmware refuses to boot something that is not properly signed. Our use case for that is I don't want um, anybody play games with my machine. I want to make sure that my machine will only boot up my Fedora and nothing else, right? I want to be able to kick the secure boot key um, that Microsoft has in there by default out of the BIOS install my own, and then I can be sure that it will only boot my stuff and not Microsoft anymore. Because, I mean, it's this, it's this, it's this PR disaster, I think, around SecuBoot because people always assume that SecuBoot, like the ESI SecuBoot stuff, is something where Microsoft wanted to be bad to us. I think it's actually really, you can turn it around and take a benefit of it and actually make your system secure and kick Microsoft out and make sure that it doesn't boot anything that uh, from somebody else except your own thing, uh, own stuff. Now, um, to make that work, um, Kai and, 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 and Daniel and David, um, they, they worked on, uh, on uh, support for actually getting, like we, we want the entire trust chain basically so that you, that the, that the uh, bootloader and then the firmware will only boot a, uh, a signed kernel that includes the internet RD and this internet RD will then find root file system and will set ev up everything properly so that the root si file system would only uh, boot if it's properly signed and so that you have the entire correct trust chain. Uh, in place, but this kind of requires us to to actually be able to talk to the bootloader because we actually need to know that it's properly um, uh, tagged, uh, like and, and, and uh, um, signed, and we need this ability because if you then pick a kernel in the in the bootloader originally, then we actually need to pass information which kernel it was into the innerd, and then the innerd needs to find the right version of the um, main operating system and only boot that because if you want to sign these things, um, then you need to make sure that the entire set of software that you have in memory um, actually fits together so that you can deal with replay attacks and mix and matching incorrect versions. If you follow at all what I'm talking here. Um, anyway, uh, so the, the end result of that is that we probably will uh, move that stuff because we need this kind of integration so that from the internet we find the right um, operating system and so on in the system D. But of course, like I mean, it's going to be optional like all the rest of it. Like if you want to use something else, use something else. But um, because we need this integration, um, we thought, okay, let's let's just merge it, and then people who don't like it can turn it off. But for everybody who actually cares about a secure system, 
who actually wants to kick out Microsoft and the NSA and everything else from their system. I think it's an absolutely nice idea if the operating system supports this on from the core on. And this is not really just about laptops. Um, I also think that uh, we need to go, like, I mean, in a post-Snowden world, you really want to make sure that your, your data center is not exploitable by the NSA. And so you want to make sure that the, the, the that the images that you run on your on your um, um, cloud on the actual physical hardware there um, will cannot be um, fucked with. Like you, you know the the thing that that Facebook between the data centers had had communication and and the NSA actually managed managed to intercept that and, and modify the actual images. I think in a, if you want to have a second data center, you need to make sure that the images like that you don't have to trust the people anymore who set up the blades and the in the things, but instead um, that, yeah, the, the machine will refuse to boot anything that is not verified by you and, and signed by you, and that the communication between us is all secure. Anyway, we believe this is kind of the, the, the responsibility of the basic operating system to make sure that it is um, integral and cannot be played with. And we also need to make sure, of course, that this doesn't end up in this game where says some central um, facility signs everything and everybody has to like wh what they tried to do basically where, where Fedora and all the other people got their keys signed by Microsoft, I think that is a completely insane scheme. We believe that people, like it's, if somebody signs something, it must be Fedora itself or the actual user. And that's kind of the scene. We want this pluralism in there that Linux traditionally had so that we can disconnect ourselves from, from any kind of central um, sig signing there. And it's, it's, it's your security and not the security of Microsoft that Tech Reboot is about. Anyway, um, this is all that I have, and I think I don't have any much time anymore. Anyway, how much time do I still have? Three minutes. So we have questions for three minutes. I have one. Not all of them, but most of them. So we have in the in the wiki, we like so the question was regarding um, the internal interfaces that that or not so internal interfaces that that system D components talk to each other with, if they are all documented and stable. And my answer to that is yes, most of them are. Like it's basically when we introduce something, uh, we are not sure if it will ex stay exactly the same thing until we um, gain some some trust in the code, and then we say okay, it's well designed. Let's open this up. You will find like like login D. And machine dean, all these uh, little um, things, they have all pretty much complete, sometimes slightly out of date because we, well, writing docs is not fun, so we, so there's sometimes a lag that the docs are updated. But uh, it's, it's all public, right? Like, and, and if it's not public right now for some of the demos, then it will be eventually. But I think even right now, pretty much every single one of our Dbus APIs is documented. No, the, the, the very new stuff that we haven't released, like the, the import tool for machinely, that bus API is currently not documented, but I probably document it very soon. But our goal is definitely to document everything there. Sooner or later. Yep. So most of the demons are automatically like you can restart them already. Like like login D, for example, it stores its entire state in slash run so that it can kill login D at any time and restart and will come back to exa exactly its state. So this is what we want to do for for all our um, services. Um, and journal D was one of the bigger problems there. Um, when we fix that, now you can restart journal D and will not lose any kind of context. Um, I think most pretty much every like network D loses some of the state, right? Like if you kill it. But uh, it's definitely our goal to do that for our own services. We want them all restartable, and that if, if they die abnormally and we start them, that they do not load load, uh, lose context. I think it's a, it's a way how demons should be designed, so that you you like I mean all software has bugs, ours too, so um, it should be robust and be able to get back. If you if you think about third party demons, um, then. Uh, we provide you the same tools that we use to make this happen, but ultimately it, it requires a special way how you write your stuff, right? Because you need to be able to, to store, whenever you change states, um, you have to, to, to put that in slash run or whatever somewhere where you can pull it out if you come back. But we, we provide quite a few tools, like, like for example, something that we needed to make journal D restartable is something 
Like, uh, journal D gets the log output from every single daemon, like it's get std out and std out from every single daemon on the system. And these file descriptors, we had to put somewhere so that if you um, terminate journal D and get it back, that we can get back these file descriptors where we can continue reading std out and std out from, from somewhere. And for that, we, we, we created a, a very minimal um, concept where you can push file descriptors into system D to keep it for you. Right, there's this, uh, hooks into the socket activation stuff. I mean, this might get very technical <laughs> right now. But it's like, uh, if you know the socket um, activation concept that systemd has where, where you can make, make systemd listen on sockets for you and then those are passed to the daemon when it's actually started. With this new facility, you can basically push a couple of more file descriptors into those that you then get passed when you're actually forked off, right? Um, so we give all this functionality to people so that they can write their own daemons that are also restartable and that where it also doesn't matter if they're running, they if they're not, and nothing is lost. But it is, it, it, it requires a certain set of thinking um, if we write the daemon preparation that you, you uh, reflect your state changes in slash run so that it can restore. I hope that's an answer that works. Well, the demos goes away. But anyway, Dbus daemon, for example, is one of the daemons where you cannot restart like like that because it will lose all its state. And, and that's kind of a <coughs> negative example. We wanted to make all our daemons work the way that we can restart them at any time, including CID1 itself. So it's over. Thank you very much. If you have further um, questions, ask me outside or something. <laughs>